Hey Defenders, welcome back. In this video, I wanna show you guys how we can install our own open source incident response platform called Velociraptor. And what Velociraptor will allow us to do is to collect, monitor, and hunt across our endpoints at the click of a few buttons. Um, so very similar to the capabilities that GRR provides us, Velociraptor will give us the ability to remotely traverse our endpoints file systems. We'll be able to perform targeted collection of digital forensic evidence simultaneously across all of our endpoints. We'll be able to monitor our endpoints such as event logs, any file modifications, process executions, and take advantage of some features that, that we aren't able to easily integrate within Wazoo. And then we also have the ability to hunt across our endpoints. So we can detect suspicious activities or remotely grab files for offline analysis. Uh, there's a, a prefla of, of pre-built hunts that we can run across our endpoints. And that'll be a little more clear as we get into it. But Velociraptor will provide us the ability to perform our incident response tasks all remotely without having to actually jump onto the endpoint itself. Another cool little feature is also being able to quarantine endpoints if that endpoint has become compromised. So the steps for this video, we are going to install a Velociraptor server. We are going to create our client packages. We're going to then deploy Velociraptor clients onto Linux boxes and as well as a Windows box. We will then run a hunt and then we will also quarantine an endpoint. So a little bit of how the architecture works, very similar to Wazoo's architecture. We will have our Velociraptor server, which will be what all of our endpoints connect to. So similar to, you could think of our Velociraptor server as like our Wazoo manager, and then our Velociraptor client will be like our Wazoo agent, right? So very similar architecture in terms of that. And then the Velociraptor Velociraptor server also provides a web user interface that your InfoSec team can use to run hunts, uh, look at endpoints, and monitor the, the health of the environment itself. And this video is sponsored by Sock Fortress. Uh, we will be following along with their blog posts uh, throughout this video, which I will link in the description below. So if you want to follow along, you can jump over to that and follow along with me. So let's go ahead and jump into it. And all right, so I'm on their blog post here. Uh, Velociraptor also has their own docs, which I will link in the description below. And then within their GitHub is where their recent releases are um, and some other resources uh, that you can use at your disposal as, as well. So uh, as of the latest version that they have released as of today is version 0.6.4 and that is what we will be deploying today so, so let's go ahead and deploy our velociraptor server uh, i am doing this on an ubuntu uh 20.0.4 release so uh, if you're looking to follow along this will be the operating system that i will be deploying the server on the agent can be deployed on uh debian based distros uh red hat based distros uh mac os as well i believe i haven't actually tested that but i believe uh, you can deploy on a mac os and then also windows endpoints as well so let's go ahead and first deploy our Velociraptor server. So what we're first going to do is grab the binary from the GitHub. And what's kind of cool about Velociraptor is they let us, there's, they provide the binary that allows us to create our own config. So, and that'll be a little more obvious as we, as we go into it here. So I have gone ahead and grabbed our binary, uh, let's go ahead and make this an executable with the chmod. Uh, I would also recommend updating DNS records that will point to your new front ends so that your Velociraptor clients will be able to connect to their front end uh, regardless if the actual server for that's running Velociraptor changes on your end or not, right? So if I specified an IP address and my Velociraptor in my Velociraptor server blew up and I had to spin up a new VM for it and that resulted in it getting assigned a new IP address, then your clients would not be able to connect, right? Because their, their config file would be pointing to the specific IP address that no longer exists, where if you create a DNS entry for it, then all you have to do is edit your DNS entry to point velo demo.opensecure.co, which is what I'll use in this example, 
to the new IP address without having to manually make that change on all of your endpoints. So I would recommend adding a DNS entry for this so that in the event, if you ever have to make a change, uh, you can do so very easily without having to manually get onto all of the agents and, and update their config files. So I've went ahead and created a DNS entry and let me make sure that works. I just called it velo demo opensecure.co and okay that's getting resolved and that's getting resolved to this ip address where if i run an if config on this box oh oh third time to charm uh you see that is the public that is the public ip address that is assigned to my box here so that's looking good so my dns records have updated accordingly so now let's go ahead and generate our config file so again this is just a binary and what we're going to do so if i ls this out you see all i have is our velociraptor binary so what we want to do is go ahead and create our config so i'm going to go ahead and copy this command here and we'll be prompted and we'll have a a interactive kind of prompt that we'll be able to to do so First, we're going to ask what operating system will the server be deployed on? Well, this is a Linux box, so I'm going to select Linux. Path to the data store directory by default, uh, they list it under opt Velociraptor, so I'll say that's fine. So that'll be where Velociraptor will store uh, its logs and all the other kind of metadata that it stores to, to, to ensure smooth operation. So I'll leave that to default. I'll go ahead and do a self-signed cert. You could also use uh, Let's Encrypt to provision a trusted cert. Um, I think though the only problem with Let's Encrypt, I think by default they the certificates are only valid for three months, I think is what Let's Encrypt does. So you would run the risk of your cert expiring. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do a self-signed cert uh, because I know end users won't be connecting to like this website via a browser right that would complain at him saying hey this is a self-signed cert i'm not going to worry about that so i'm going to say it's self-signed cert and then we're saying okay what's the public dns of the master so what what address will the clients need to connect to in order for them to register and be able to connect with our velociraptor server where in this case that is velo demo.opensecure.co. So go ahead and say that. Uh, enter the front end port to listen on. So yeah, we'll go ahead and say 8,000. That's good. Uh, enter the port for the GUI to listen on. So we're saying 8,889. That's fine. So you could change that if you wanted to say, for for example, if you wanted your front end to listen on 443, you can make that change here. Or if you wanted your GUI to listen on a different port, you can make that change here. So our clients are going to connect to our front end port. So you may need to open firewall rules to allow this through because these are a little abnormal ports. So you'll need to ensure that your fire, that proper firewall rules are in place to allow traffic from your endpoints to, in my case, velodemo.opensecure.co on port 8000 and 8889. So I'll say, okay, are you using Google, uh, Google domains, I'm going to say no, and then we're going to use and then and now we're going to set our GUI username uh, or email address to access the Velociraptor web interface. So here I'll just say info at opensecure.co and I'll give it a password of admin. And then uh, once you've added all the users you want to add, you just hit enter. And lastly, we get path to the logs directory, which I'll just leave as the default. That's good. Uh, where should I write the server config file? So we'll just call it server config.yaml. And then the client config file will just be client config.yaml. And now that that has ended, if we go ahead and run an ls now, here we see our two new files created for us. So let's go ahead and look at our server config.yaml. So what this script is doing is creating our config files for us with the details that we've inputted uh, through this interactive session here. So if I open up my server config file, you see our server URL is velo demo, and here you can see the front end, right, is listening on port 8000, which is what we set within the, the prompt uh, just a second ago. 
If we scroll down, we see our API for this is listening on 8001 and then our GUI, which will connect to via our browser is listening on port 8889. So that looks good. And then if we also open our client config.yaml, so here you can see, okay, what what server are the clients going to connect to? Well, here we see it connecting to our Velo demo and on port 8000, right? Which is what our front end is listening on. So that looks good. And then all this other stuff is pre-populated for us. Uh, there are a few options and stuff you can set, which I'm not gonna get into in this video. So if you wanna explore that uh, by yourself, uh, feel feel free to, to kind of tinker with some of the options that you have. So we've used this binary to create our two config files, but we're, we haven't installed the server yet, right? All we've done is actually create our configs for it. So now what we need to do is actually create our Debian package because I'm running this on an Ubuntu box that will create our server binary for us, right? So I'll go ahead and copy this command and we can kind of walk through this real quick. So again, I'm calling the Velociraptor binary that we use to create our config files. Um, I am specifying the flag of config saying, hey, I want you to config. The config file that I want you to use will be the server.config.yaml. This is a Debian box that I am deploying the server on. And then what I wanted to create is the server, not the client, because we first need to, we first need to create our server. So I'm gonna specify Someone tell the Velociraptor binary here, I want you to create a, a Debian package for our server and then the binary and then you can specify a name if you want as well. So once I run this, this is now taking our options that we've specified within our server config.yaml and is building a Debian package with the server binary. So now if I list this out, now you can see our Debian package has been installed, has been created for us, right? So now all we need to do is, so now all we need to do is install it. So I'll go ahead and copy this command here to run a DPKG to tell the operating system, hey, I want you to install this Debian package and this will install our Velociraptor server for us. So I went ahead and hit enter. And now if we run a Velociraptor status, uh, we should see our Velociraptor server now up and running. So it creates a service for us called Velociraptor underscore server. And here you can see it's loaded our server config file. And if I do a net stat, we should also now see it listening on the ports on our ports, right? Our front end, our, this is our GUI back end. This was the API and uh, I forget what this one is. But now if, so here within my browser, if I navigate to velodemo.opensecure.co, uh, the GUI is listening on 8,889 by default. So I'll go ahead and specify my port there. And okay, we're getting a connection refuse. I just verified the firewall is good, but actually I see that this is just bound to the loopback interface. So I'm actually, so I probably should have made that change before we created the server binary, but that's fine. So I'll go ahead and go into Etsy, uh, Velociraptor server config.yaml, and I'm actually gonna bind the GUI to, I'm just going to say all interfaces. So I'm going to say oh, dot, oh, dot, oh, dot, oh. And I will restart our Velociraptor server. And let's see if we get luck now. Okay, cool. So now we're prompted. So, uh, so if you're following along, uh, you may need to make that change. You'll probably need to make that change. Uh, so you could, I could hard specify it to the IP address assigned to my interface, uh, but here just using o -O 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 says on all interfaces. So that'll work uh, for this demo. So now I'll, I'll do my username, which was info at opensecure.co and then the password of admin. And now we are into the web interface. So we are now accessing our Velociraptor server. So that looks good. So now 
what we need to do is deploy our agent. So if we scroll down here, uh, yeah, we're in the web UI, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we're going to use the same, let me play this out. So we're going to use very similar command to what we use to deploy our uh, server Debian package, right? So now let's go ahead and deploy a client Debian package as well. So you'll notice we're generating our own packages. So we'll follow this command to create our Debian package that we'll be able to use to install on Ubuntu or Debian boxes. Uh, if we scroll down, we also have the command to create a Red Hat package and then a Windows MSI, which we'll get into here in a sec. So you'll notice that the commands look very similar, except rather than specifying Debian, we specify RPM. So let's first go ahead and create our Debian client package. So, oh, let me do a dot slash. All right, and now if I ls this out, and you'll notice also, uh, before we get into that, our config, we are now pointing to our client config.yaml, right? And not our server config, which we just uh, which we just used. And then we're specifying, hey, I want you to create a Debian, and I want this to be a client. So now we have our Velociraptor client.dev package. And then on my Velo client server, so this is a new server that I just switched to. Uh, this guy is running Ubuntu uh, 20.0.4. And what we'll need to do is get this Debian package over to our client. And I'm just going to use a SCP uh, command for that. Let me get the IP address. So I'm going to say SCP, uh, let's Velociraptor. The loss. Velociraptor underscore client dot deb and the IP address I'm going to send this to will be 5.161. That's the IP address of my client here. And then I'm just going to throw this in the temp directory. So I'll be prompted to log on. I'll present the password. All right. And now that that file has been transferred over, now if I, on my client, if I go into my temp directory, I should see that package here and here we go right so now we have our debian client package that we can use to install our endpoint and so now all i need to do now is just run the installer similar to what we did for the server but on the client side we're going to use dpkg to install the velociraptor client all right, so that's been created. And if I do a system CTL status, Velociraptor underscore client, we see that this guy is now up and running. And here we see our client config.yaml file, right? So very similar to what how we installed our server, but instead of using the server Debian package, we're using our client Debian package. So now if I go back into my web UI and I select the, the little magnifying glass guy here, we see our client has now checked in. So if we select this guy, uh, if we see what's been collected since the, the agent has been uh, installed, uh, we get a little meta details here. We see some artifact collection. Uh, we see the Mac address of the box. We see when the box was deployed. So we get a little metadata, the operating system platform, but where Velociraptor is really powerful is allowing us to run hunts. So if we select the view artifacts, Velociraptor comes pre-populated with a ton of these jobs here uh, across, across a good mix of operating systems, right? So we have our Linux, we have our Mac OS, uh, our server. So these are things we can run on the Velociraptor server itself and then Windows jobs as well. So if we go ahead and let's just look at a Linux one. Um, let's select the Linux events SSH login. So and then uh, selecting an artifact to get a little description of, OK, what is this job actually going to do? So in this Linux events SSH login, this monitoring Artifact watches the auth.log file for new successful SSH login events and relays them back to the server. So what we can do 
and we can also customize this if we want as well so you can select the pencil and now like say for example my ssh logs weren't writing to var log off.log i wanted to change that to something else well i could just change that instead of off let's say like messages i can make my change and then save my artifact there as well and then you can also get into and then you can also get into the query that's being made right um uh writing writing queries is a little out of reach for uh for this video so i'm not gonna get too deep into how you can write your own queries and everything but what's nice velociraptor does come pre-bundled with all of these queries that we can run uh, just at the click of a button so let's go ahead and actually run a hunt that will grab all of the ssh login attempts from our agent so if i I'll go ahead and select the hunt manager. I'll select my plus icon here. Let's give it a description. I'll say SSH logins. And you can include conditions on what agent you want to run this on, right? So I could say run everywhere. If I assigned a label to my agent, I could say a specific label. Or if I wanted to run on a particular operating system, right? So say I have a bundle of Windows endpoints, Linux endpoints, and Mac OS endpoints where I only want to run SSH logins across Linux endpoints, I could select that there. And in this case, I'll just say run everywhere. You can also specify that. Let's then select our select artifacts. And I'll do a search for our SSH login. So I'll go ahead and select this guy. Uh, again, you'll get populated with a little de description of the hunt that you are going to run. We can select configure parameters. So that looks, so you could edit you could edit these parameters on the fly if you wanted to as well, but I don't need to do that. You can then specify resources that you want to use so you can limit the amount of CPU uh, that the agent will consume when running this job. You can set max rows or max file uploads if you want. And then you will then review it. So we are going to again run our SSH login and then I'll go ahead and select launch. And but that doesn't it's it is kind of a little bit confusing. That doesn't actually run the job. So that just kind of cues it up for you to be able to to run it when you want. So now I'll go ahead and select this guy and I'll go ahead and select the play button and we'll be prompted. Are you sure you want to run this hunt? We'll say run it. And then within a few seconds, we should see our finished clients here populate to one. And sure enough, here we go. And then if we look at our notebook here, we can see all of here. We can see everything that the hunt was able to collect. So again, using our SSH login uh, here, we see all the SSH login attempts. So here we can see from my IP address, this is the only SSH attempt that was accepted. We see, uh, this guy is being a bad actor and is trying to and is trying to SSH onto my box. Here we can see all of his failed attempts, the attempted user uh, he's trying to use and so on and so forth. So pretty cool. Now let's go ahead and actually deploy this on a Windows box. The Windows is a little different. We will need to create our own MSI file. Um, and we're going to go ahead and walk through that now. And all right, so I'm on my Windows box here uh, and so what we'll need to do is create our own MSI file that has our config parameters set for us, right? So similar to how we just created, similar how we, we used our binary to create our client config files for our Linux agents, we will create our own custom MSI file that will contain the right front end URL for the client to point to, and that will then be used to deploy to install Velociraptor onto our Windows endpoint. So let me actually go to the Velociraptor docs because there is a tool uh, called Wix, I believe, that we will need to install on our Windows box so that we can create our MSI file. Uh, so uh, yeah, here we go. So I'll install the Wix application onto my Windows host. Uh, let me just grab the Wix exe from their GitHub. So I'll go ahead and run this guy. 
Uh, and I need the .NET Framework 351. All right, let me follow this guide. Uh, start, control panel. Let's see if we can get through this together here. <laughs> uh, programs. And programs and features. So let's probably turn this on or off. And I'll select next. Uh, next is fine. Next. Next and features. Okay, so here I'm on features. So I'll go ahead and select this .NET framework and features. So I'll hit next, install. And this should give us the .NET framework that uh, Wix is needing to be able to install. So you may have to enable this feature on your end as well. And uh, these should be the steps to be able to, to do so. So we'll go ahead and wait a few minutes for this to install. And then we'll try to install the Wix executable one more time. Go ahead and say run. Okay, cool. So we've got past that error. Let's go ahead and select install. And now Wix should be installing for us. All right, so we now have Wix installed, so that looks good. I'll go ahead and exit out of that. Uh, I'll close these tabs here. We should be done with that. Okay. So what we're first, what, what we now need to do is, since we're using Wix to build our MSI, we need the source code of Velociraptor. So I'll go ahead and select the releases, the latest release, and if I scroll down here, we will download our zip file source code of Velociraptor. So I'll go ahead and download this guy. And then in my downloads, I'll go ahead and extract. And I'll just throw it into Velociraptor. Yep, that works. So I'll go ahead and extract all of the source code of Velociraptor. So, and maybe I need to turn, let me turn Windows Defender off. Uh, hopefully, let me, I'm going to re-extract that just in case Windows Defender uh, removed some files that should have been uh, included. So I'm going to go ahead and run this one more time. And uh, so deploying the, the Linux client packages and as well as the windows msi uh it only needs to be done once which is nice so it is kind of a tedious process of because we're having to configure these packages for our own configuration right being our our front end url the certs that we use to create it is a little tedious to kind of first get this up and running but but once we have these files create, once we have these packages and the MSI created, uh, we only need to do it once, and then we can deploy that out across all of our all of our endpoints. So in the source code of the project, there is a directory called docs, and then within docs there is Wix, and this will contain the scripts that we'll use to build the MSI. So we'll go ahead and copy the Wix directory and I'll just throw it to the actual downloads folder. So I'll paste that there. So I'm going to go ahead and open a command prompt and CD into downloads. So, and then I'm going to CD into Wix. So that is what's used to build our MSI that will point our agent to our front end URL and then the certs that were also created for that as well. So I'll go ahead and open this up with Notepad. And that is not very easy to read. I'm gonna download Notepad++ real quick. So you could make some tweaks uh, if you want to change like the manufacturer name, maybe if you want to change it to, to your own, right? You can change some of the, the service names here, the binary name that it runs as you could change here as well if you wanted to. And if we scroll down, we see our config file that it's going to take, right? So our client config.yaml. So let's go ahead and create a directory here within our Wix directory and let's call this guy output. So I'll say make dir, say output. And we'll also need to grab our velociraptor.exe file, right? So if I go back into their releases, 
uh, I need to download our Velociraptor. This is a is an AMD 64 bit uh, CPU. So I'm gonna go ahead and download this executable. So now within my downloads, we should have our Velociraptor executable there. Yep, that looks good. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and copy the Velociraptor uh, dash windows. Velociraptor uh, dash V. So I'm going to copy the executable that we just downloaded from the GitHub into uh, into output. And then we're going to call it Velociraptor exe. And we have to call it exactly Velociraptor exe because that is what our XML file is expecting. Right. So we need to call it exactly that. So veloc velociraptor.exe, so that looks good. So we'll go ahead and copy that. And now we need to copy our client config, which we generated on our velociraptor server, right? So we have our client config.yaml here. Uh, let me see if I can just select this guy. And I'll just create a new file. on my windows box here uh so within notepad i'll say i'll just paste that there and that all looks good so again right we want to ensure that we're pointing to our correct server url and that our certificate is going to be correct so let me go ahead and save this i'll just select all types and i'll just call it client.config.yaml all right, and now if I look at my file explorer, we should see our client config.yaml. That looks good. All right, and that looks good. So now let's go ahead and copy our client config.yaml over into our output directory as well. So output. And so now if we CD into our output directory, we should have our two files here. So we have our executable binary, and then we also have our client config, which will populate that with the config parameters that are needed to actually connect to our front end Velociraptor server. And we don't need any DLLs, libraries, or anything like that, which is nice. So these are the only two files that we'll need to create the MSI file. Now we'll go ahead and CD back a directory into our Wix and let's go ahead and build our custom MSI. And they've, they've, and the Velociraptor guys have created this batch file for us that we can run to, that will create our custom MSI file for us. So I'll run build custom.bat and here we can see it's using Wix, right? So it's, again, we have to have Wix installed prior to, prior to running this to now create our MSI file. And now I can just run ms, msi exec slash i and then provide the custom.msi. And now window, and now we will install our Velociraptor agent onto our Windows box. So I'll go ahead and run that and we should see now our Velociraptor service has been installed. Uh, if we go ahead and look at services that are on the box, we should now see our Velociraptor. We should see now our Velociraptor service and sure enough, sure we do. Uh, so we see that it's also in a running state. So we should be able to select the magnifying glass again and reload in now we see our new Windows agent has now connected. Uh, we have our little green indicator here saying that we are connected. All right, so pretty cool. So the installation for Windows, it is a little more cumbersome, but, but now all I need to do is take my custom MSI file that we just created, which was this guy here. And now all I have to do is pass that out to all of my endpoints and deploy that. You can do that via GPL policy or manually if you don't have that many endpoints or however you want to deploy it. So while while it is a little bit tedious of a task having to deploy having to build the custom MSI yourself, you do only have to do it once and then you can distribute that across all of your endpoints, which is nice. So back into our web UI here, um, 
So here we get some details again around our Windows endpoint. If we go into our, if we select our view artifacts and scroll down a little bit, actually we can just filter and make it a little easier. Uh, filter on Windows. Here are all of the Windows jobs that we can do. So let's see if we can load the Chrome history. This might be kind of interesting. So I'll go ahead and go back into Hunt. I'll select my checkbox or plus box. Say Chrome history, if I can spell it right. And so here it's estimating how many clients it would affect. So because I know my Linux box doesn't have Chrome installed on it, let's actually make a condition that will only run on our windows operating system and now you can see our affected clients has dropped down to one uh which is which is correct when we only have one endpoint that is windows and then let's go ahead and search for our chrome windows chrome history here we can see the job that it's going to run uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip over the review and select launch and then again I'm going to select the the hunt state and then actually select the play button to actually run it and so this should run and finish up for us so it's asking our so essentially what's happening is it's running that query that we just saw the agent is running that query for us and now <laughs> And now look at this, if we go into notebook, here we see all of the Chrome history that happened on my Windows endpoint, right? So here we can see us going to GitHub to get the Wix toolset, uh, looking at the Velociraptor docs. Uh, so pretty cool, right? You can export these if you want, um, to the CSV. So, you know, if malware gets on a box or you're investigating some user's activity, maybe they maybe some of your security alerts have triggered saying, hey, a user on this endpoint has reached out to a known phishing site and you want to maybe verify that, you could run this job, look at their Chrome history and extract what sites they visited, which is pretty cool. Another really cool feature is the ability to quarantine uh, your endpoints, which is really awesome. And what this quarantining will do will block all communications, all network communications to anything else except for your velociraptor server so once you quarantine it you could still run your investigations you could of course then unquarantine it when you've uh when you've determined that the system is healthy again or it was a false positive or whatever the case may be uh this does only work for windows endpoints unfortunately it doesn't work for linux you could probably build your own an artifact that quarantines Linux boxes by maybe doing like an IP tables rule that blocks all traffic except to your domain of where your front end is running. Um, but built in natively is the Windows uh, quarantining. So I'll go ahead and select the client ID and I'll select the little medical looking kit here to actually quarantine this host. And what should happen is I should lose my RDP session right because uh the windows host will only be able to communicate to my velociraptor server so i'll go ahead and say test and we'll go ahead and say yes do it so now our server has told our velociraptor agent to quarantine this host and as you can see i'm trying to click around i'm i'm, I'm trying to my rdp session has now broken Right, so pretty cool, right? We are now, we have now quarantined this endpoint all from Velociraptor's web UI. And then when I went to unquarantine it, say I've done my investigation, everything's good. Look how fast that is. It was a snap of a finger, which is really awesome. So again, I can quarantine, say test two. So let's say I wanna quarantine the host. I say, okay, let me do some more investigative uh, tasks. Maybe let's find Let's go ahead and see what ports are listening on our Windows endpoint. So looks like we're going to run this listening ports hunt. So I'll go back into my hunt, select my plus symbol. I'll just say ports uh, again. I'll just say my Windows box and select artifacts. And what was that called? Ports something. Uh, Windows network listening ports. So let's go ahead and run this guy. And again, this device is quarantined, and but the only traffic that is allowed is to our Velociraptor server, right? Which is pretty cool. So 
we can still do our whatever investigation we want to do while the box is unable to communicate to any other devices on the network or whatever command and control servers it's listening on so now uh that that artifact has now ran and now we can see all the ports that are listening on our endpoint all right so pretty cool and then so i've done my investigation um I've done my investigation you see that i'm still quarantined i can then select this guy remove the quarantine and now our remote session oh well my session has timed out but if i jump back onto this guy you'll see now i get prompted to log back in so meaning the quarantine has been lifted i wouldn't even be prompted that if it was still quarantined and now i can connect again so pretty cool uh, Velociraptor is a really powerful tool. Um, it is really nice to add to to your security stack, and I do highly recommend it. In future videos, we're going to dig into Velociraptor's API to automate some tasks. Um, one thing we'll focus on as well is automating quarantining of endpoints uh, based on you know particular rule conditions, and we'll dive into it a little further. There are a again, there are a ton of artifacts, so that are all pre-built and do all of these jobs for us. Uh, so it comes baked with a ton of different jobs that we can run just right out of the box, which makes it really powerful. And you also have the ability to, to write your own, which is really cool. So I think that wraps it up for today's video. I appreciate you guys hanging out with me and I will see you in the next one.